pricing for 2020 on Premier, what are you hearing? Uh, I'm hearing anything between 10% up to 100% up. The difference being 10% up is for the UK market and 100% up is for the Hong Kong market. Not exactly that. There are one or two people who are repositioning, uh, but apart from that, between 10 and 25% is, is, is the most typical. And I think it's the guys who are already expensive will probably go up by more, and the guys who have tried to keep their price, prices fair will go up by less. Um, so, you know, philosophical thing. Um, but the problem is there is no wine to be had anywhere. Um, everybody has bought up everything thus far. Um, wow. And the growers keep saying they get people coming, knocking on their doors, saying, well, I just desperately need to get your wine. I don't mind what price I pay. Um, it's, it's, it's not healthy. It's not, not a great lookout uh, for the future. The other thing that's happening is that uh, with the incredibly high prices being paid for bits of vineyard land, um, the French government officials have just been sending around letters to anybody who has transferred the, the, the succession plan. Uh, normally before you're somewhere between 60 and 70, you transfer the vineyards to the next generation. And that there is then um, a calculation of what tax you should pay on that. And it's based around the sort of the value of the wine, but the tax authorities are now saying it needs to be based around the selling price of the vineyards. And we will take uh, as our guide for that, the last transaction. And given that a whole load of Grand Cru's have been selling for sort of north of 50 million euros per hectare, suddenly anybody and, and the authorities have the right to backdate for three years. So anybody over the last three years who has passed their um, vineyards on to their children and paid what they thought to be the correct amount of tax uh, is suddenly being hit. They're suddenly getting a letter saying, and we want another million euros from you, uh, you know, which is a complete disaster. And if that continues, then it's going to be the end of, of sort of local ownership because people simply won't be able to afford to pass it on. Uh, wow. So it's it's definitely a worrying, a worrying moment. The other thing which is crazy is why are people paying ever more high prices for the land when uh, it, its ongoing value is in doubt? Because if global warming does get any worse, then it is quite possible that Pinot Noir is no longer going to enjoy itself in the great vineyards, um, possibly not even Chardonnay. Um, and equally, there are a lot of the vines which are dying because uh, the vine rootstock can't cope with the hot, dry conditions. So it is really a moment of a little bit of doubt as to the long term future. So to pay some prices which are ludicrously higher than anybody's ever paid before um, seems to me to be nuts. So. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. So Very don't do it, guys. The next time somebody comes to you with a proposition, could you just help me out? And, uh, Buy me a <laughs> hectare of musiny. Uh, think twice. Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! Very. What was the last transaction in musiny? Was it the Feverly? In musiny, uh, probably the Feverly one. Um, but there've been little bits of Bomar, a bit of Close Saint Denis, uh, uh, tiny bits just changed hands. Whole load of Griot Chambertin. So to give you an indication, the the previous um, rate for that was sort of set for the taxation was 293,000 euros per oeuvre, and uh, some has just sold for 2 million euros. So you've basically multiplied by eight. So if you paid a tax bill of 200,000 or something like that, they might hit you for an uplift of, well, they might change it to 1.6 1, 1. million. Um, you know, and some of these guys have earned a fair amount of money from what they're doing, but, but that takes it to a different scale. So who we're missing Richard, we're missing who else? Brian and Brian, two Brian's. Brian, two Brian's and a Richard. Um, <laughs> is that for the current exchange rate? <laughs> Richard. Um, right, so we have got today 16 wines. So um, the order that I put them in, I, um, yeah is we've got a trio of 2017s to kick off. Um, and um, 
uh, and then we'll look at a trio of Richard Chambertin, then a couple of Claude Saint-Jacques, and by then I will, I will leave you for your dinner. So Sebastian is passing around the Richard, and I gather everything was in, the, everything was in good condition, uh, which is nice. Incidentally, uh, you guys probably haven't been tucking into 2017s very much. It's only when you try and drink in a bone restaurant you have to have 17s because it's the oldest wine on the list. Um, and I'm pleased to say I, I had a delicious dinner on Saturday with Mr. Moore, formerly of Hong Kong. Yeah, um, Neil, Alex. Um, and uh, and he, he, he uh, sprung for a bottle of Latash 17, which was really very, very happy to... Uh, uh, to be drunk it wasn't too closed at all and um, was a beautiful bottle but they've already got on the wine list at that restaurant their Rousseau's including Chambertin and uh, Claude de Bears are 2019 being proposed to drink in a restaurant I think that is a great shame love them yeah yeah what, what do they charge for the 19s at the restaurant um uh, 1300 1500 in in euros but that's a lot. It is. I mean, it, I mean, four or five years ago, which probably was seven or eight. Yeah. Um, so I mean, basically, basically, what the um, restaurants here tend to do is that they put on a standard, quite high markup, but they don't take into account the fact that there could be a secondary market price, which is a lot higher still. Um, or some of them, um, some of them, as we we discovered once when. Um, um, uh, Fang and Crystal were in town and said, let's go out and have lunch together. We went to what should have been a good restaurant, but almost all the good wines on the list said, uh, en vieillissement, so waiting in the cellar for aging, which is translated as, uh, if you're local, you'll see that on the list and, and order it up for next time you're there. But if you're coming in from out of town, we don't want you to uh, plunder all our best bottles, which I found very active. And I haven't been back to that restaurant soon. <laughs> And what's worse, Crystal got stung by a wasp, so uh, we definitely didn't go out to that restaurant. Oh, oh. That's for you. That's for you. So, so Jasper, okay. what do you think the yeah. price that they, the, the restaurant got it sold for? Is it like probably now 500 euros that they're being sold it for and therefore they're selling it for 1300? Or No, I, th I think they'd be paying quite a lot less than that. Right. Yeah, I think they might be in the sort of 300-ish range, but I'm guessing... Oh. Oh my God! Buy a restaurant. Well, it, it really, was, it really was not long ago that yeah. um, we were buying Chambertin from under a hundred euros from from the demand areas, and then it oh. went up. Yeah, I mean the probably the 2014s, 2013s, 2014s would have been under a hundred at the time, but of course the the restaurants have neither the place nor necessarily the funding to uh, uh, to store it, so. Anyway, so Jasper, if you decide to open a restaurant, we'll fund you. <laughs> so look, there, is, there is something I heard, and I can't remember which grow. It might have been uh, Arnoux Lachaud, but if you wanted to get the top wines as a restaurant, in order to get your your next shipment, you know they'd sell you six bottles. But you had to produce the six corks of the wine, of bottles that have been opened in order to get the next six. Oh, that's very smart. Very smart, which means that they've all got to be drunk in the restaurant. Uh, and you can't, um, you know, you can't then flip them on the secondary market for, for a fortune. Um, I mean, it's really sad that it's necessary, but it makes sense. Because um, in times gone past, there were three-star Michelin restaurants who would be selling a lot of their allocation in that form. Greetings, Richard. Hi, Jasper. Apologies. That's all right. No worries. <laughs> What have I missed? Oh, we're just waiting for you. To yeah. Yeah. The, the decision was made that we decided what would be the three best bottles, and they've already been poured and drunk. And, uh, but we're starting with the three 2017s. So, I mean, I think you all know the story about 2017. It was um, the biggest crop for quite a while, and there certainly hasn't been anything the same size since in Reds. But they all, it was a warm summer, not as hot as some of the subsequent ones, and not quite as dry. So everything ripened cheerfully, and the size of the crop just means that these wines are really accessible. They don't have quite the same precision and quite the same depth as the truly great vintages, but we don't need every single vintage to be great. We just need to have wines to drink as well. Um, I know you guys are lucky enough to have plenty of more mature vintages, and uh, I'm sure you'll be encouraging a few more American collectors to, to decide that they need to retire or 
sell uh, sell their sellers and stock up a bit more. But anyway, so you've got one, two, three, Ruchot, Chambertin, uh, Chambertin, Claude de Bears, and Chambertin. Uh, I put them in that order, though nowadays, with Suriel in charge uh, of the tastings, they always taste the Chambertin before the Claude de Bears. But um, I decided to leave it that way around once the wines are got a few years oh. age. Um, so uh, she also is a huge fan of the Ruchot Chambertin, as am I. Um, and um, maybe if you just, while I'm chatting away about this, that and the other, if you make sure you taste those three so that then we, we can talk about them, you've already got them, already got them tasted and, uh, and on board. Um, but one of the things that Russo has got that keeps it at the top of the pack uh, ahead of challenges like Duroche and the Dugas and so on is that they have big land holdings. Um, so for example, of these three, Ruchot Chambertin, um, they've got a hectare, uh, which I think makes them the biggest. Um, and uh, Chambertin, it's two and a half hectares, and Claude Bears, it's one and a half hectares. So there's only the, when Trappé and Rossignol Trappé were together, they were more, but in Chambertin, and uh, possibly Pierre Demois is more in, um, in Claude Bears. Uh, but basically, Rousseau, like DRC, they're fortunate enough to have the biggest holdings in a lot of the vineyards that they own. Um, so um, it's interesting, um, we, we're going to go on doing it on a few occasions. Yeah, so afterwards with 2011, you'll have Claude Bears and Chambertin side by side. 2001, you'll have the same. 1988 and 96, different vintages, but you got the two together. Uh, and I think it's really, really interesting because it is not a slam dunk necessarily as to which is the greater vineyard. Um, I'm just checking. Yes, in Claude de Bears, it's definitely Demois first, then Drew and Rose, then Rousseau, and in Chambertin, nowadays it's Rousseau first, then Trappé and Rossignol Trappé and Camus. But um, having just recommended that people shouldn't buy vineyards, there are rumors getting stronger that Domaine Camus, it's high time that came up for sale because they've got such a lot of great vineyards and they make wines so appallingly badly. Um, it would be a shame <laughs> if it didn't get sold um, or at least the vineyards rented out. Uh, uh, it's a domain, it's, they've got 1.7 hectares of Chambertin, three hectares of Charme, three, nearly four hectares of Mazoyer, 1.5 of Latricia Chambertin and a bit of Mazzy Chambertin. And um, fortunately, these days, almost all their grapes are going elsewhere rather than being turned into wine at the domain. Anyway, we're not here to talk about Camus. We're here to talk about Rousseau. Um, so Rousseau, this is a, a, a plot, the Claudet Rousseau. Originally, Rousseau in 1977, they bought that and a bit more. And then they decided it was too much, uh, more than they needed. So they kept the walled bit called the Claudet Rousseau. Uh, and they sold on to Munieret Giborg, for example, uh, and to Monsieur Bonnefond, um, the rest of the um, Ruchot that they had. So Monsieur Bonnefond gave his to um, uh, the Rumiers to look after, first of all Jean-Marie and then Christophe. And uh, that plot has actually been sold to um, uh, 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 another investor, um, but at least for the foreseeable future, we'll stay with Christophe. And there's a further plot of reshot, the bit that Fred uh, Emona or Esmona has been making that has also been sold. That's been sold to LVMH, i.e. Claude Lombre. And as from 2021, Claude Lombre will make part of it and Fred Esmona will keep part of it until he, fin he gets to retirement age and then it will all go to Lombre. So there are, there are lots of changes uh, happening at the moment. Um, and I can't remember when we last saw each other and when we spoke, uh, but also, Charles um, van Kennet of uh, Hudelo Nola has taken on a huge number of vineyards, which used to be uh, re um, either sharecropped or rented by uh, Laurent Ponceau, by Amélie Berthaud, and by Domaine René Leclerc. So it's what was the uh, Domaine de Chezot of the Mercier family. That's been sold up and has gone to Domaine Hudelo Nola. But it's not quite clear if the previous people will be able to keep some of it to go on making. Oh, that would be good, anyway, so yeah. with, in Russia, there's also Henri Magnian. Uh, he has a small bit of Rouchot. He's a very good grower. Um, and Marchand Griot has a tiny amount. 
um, but uh, miniature. Uh, but I mean, the three big ones of quality are, the, are obviously Rumier, Mure, Giborg, and um, Arousse. And uh, it's it's absolutely Cyrielle's favorite. And I do love it. It's so delicate. It's got there's something in line with with Echezo in so far as that it's not a great big blockbuster ever reshot. It is all about the elegance uh, and the detail um, that you should get lots of little flavors uh, moving across the tongue. Um, and they replanted a bit in 2003, which Cyril thinks rather than damaging it, having younger vines, there's actually been a benefit. I don't know what the quality of the old vines were like, but the balance between having a substantial number of old vines and some younger ones, she thinks has sort of given the vineyard a little bit more life. Um, so for me, it's now definitely number four in the hierarchy behind um, the three long established big names. Um, if we talk a little bit about the background, of course, Armand Rousseau, uh, the chap who, who set it all up, um, and then Charles Rousseau, um, Rousseau born in um, 1923 and died just, what, 2016, something like that, sort of a great advanced age. And it was a, it, uh, the transition from Armand to Charles was quite straightforward because Armand was, was either killed or badly damaged in a car accident, and Charles basically got control from uh, the end of the 50s. Um, but it was a little bit difficult between Charles and Eric, Eric, who's, who's exactly my age. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was having difficulties that his father would never really let him take over. Uh, so he sort of forced to ban him from, uh, from the actual winery. Um, and it's gone much, much better between um, Eric and his second daughter, Cyrielle. He's got two daughters, one born in 86, one in 88. And Cyrielle is the one who is taken on. It doesn't really matter whether it's Eric or Cyril in charge. They're not planning to change things. Uh, it's pretty much seamless. Eric didn't change that much um, in how his father made the wine. He did much improve what was going on in the vineyards. And in particular, he took more care with all the vineyards. So I think from Eric's time onwards, uh, the, the sort of other uh, Grand Cru's and a couple of Premier Cru's in the village, Chivre, um, started looking a lot smarter than they had before and in fact in in 2020 vintage i was knocked sideways even by the the village chevrolet from russo i thought was absolutely brilliant by the time you get to the top end one or two of the vineyards were getting a little bit high in ripeness and alcohol um i think claire laroche came in at 15 and was a bit marked by it some of the other grand crews at 14 and a half um and interestingly i thought the chambertin coped with that and the claire bears slightly less well just to give you a fast forward. Um, so between the Chambertin and the Clé de Bears, most people, uh, I mean, you are so experienced with them, I'm not going to be telling you anything new, uh, but the marketplace slightly puts Chambertin ahead of Clé de Bears, and there's a feeling that it ought to be the more senior. Um, sometimes you hear that the Rousseaus think that the Clé de Bears is the better wine, but I think that's probably them just pushing back against the concept that the Chambertin must be the better. I think when they're young, the Clé de Bez has uh, is a more supple, more immediately friendly wine. Uh, normally, whenever I've drunk them side by side with age, I've tended to prefer the Chambertin, but other palates may differ. Well, we, we did that side by side tasting <laughs> last year. Yeah. yeah. And? Uh, and I think we, we did make Clé de Bez more elegant. Yeah. Like, uh, younger, but, you know, Long term, Chambertin is a bit more. Yeah. I think there's just a little bit more structure in the Chambertin. It, it's sort of, I, I get a similar parallel between Batar Maraché and Bienvenue Batar Maraché, uh, though mm. there it's a little bit clearer from where the vines are on the slope that the Batar, it's understandable that it has a bit more depth and power. But when they're young wines, I'd probably rather drink the Bienvenue. In the case of Chambertin and Claude de Bez, there isn't that much difference because they're side by side. Um, Chambertin de Bez possibly pushes back a little bit um, further up the slope. Um, it's is there more grain, or is it? Um, is there more there's, there's a little bit more marl in the um, so de Bez, uh, so white marl. Um, I don't know that I get a, com a complete consistency from all the people who make both. 
Uh, I definitely found there was a similar profile in all the sellers with both that I tasted in 2020, that the Clos de Bears seemed to have taken the heat more than the uh, Chambardin had done. Uh, but um, yeah. Who else makes that Chambardin is best? Right? Uh, it's both. He, they, he has both. Uh, yeah. So um, if I were, uh, Dujac have 0 0.05 of Chambertin and 0.24 of Bears. So it is more of Bears, but they, they make them together. Um, and uh, they've, they've actually changed that. Now they are doing uh, a farmage, a rental, whereas previous, uh, initially they were doing a sharecropping. Uh, so now it's sort of money that changes hands rather than um, wine that changes hands. With the, the the owner of that plot. Yeah, um, for some reason, we have recently um, prices have flipped around between the Bez and the Chambertin. The Bez in the more recent vintages might be actually more expensive than the Chambertin. I don't know. Uh, sure. In what's happening in the marketplace, I mean, they'll be the same price from the demand. Uh, I'm pretty sure they always were. I don't think that will have changed. But afterwards. Uh, you're probably more up on market prices. I, I care about what the wine tastes like, and uh, I leave it to you to play around with, uh, with well, indeed, to make the market in some cases. Um, anyway, Michael, do you have a view on the difference, difference in pricing at the moment between the two? I, I, I've just been shocked by how much the prices have risen in yeah. the secondary market, especially for Russo. Yeah. yeah. Like, in the 17s, they are more expensive than... 13, 14, seven, right? Yep. And actually, actually, you're now starting to hit, what is it, north of 3,000 pounds per bottle for these? For 17. No, no, for like any kind of chamatan or all the best. I mean, the but do you see any difference in pricing between the two vineyards? No. I some, 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 yes, there is there is a bit, but I, but I agree with with I agree with Greg's point that I think there's such a desire for fine wine or premium wines mm. that the pricing has moved up so much that it's hard to keep track. <laughs> As it's just like moving in such a strong direction, right? You should you should have checked the market at the beginning of this evening session and check it again at the end and see if there's a change. Um, the other factor, of course, is that they do have um, uh, sort of pr approximately twice as much of the Chambertin that they have of the Clos de Bears. Um, Bears is, is, is half what they, uh, they have of Chambertin. Uh, volume production. Yeah, I'm um, in yeah. touch more than half, but yes, approximately. The only thing I would say is that their Chambertin holdings sort of start at the road, Route des Grands Cru, and go up the hill, up to the forest, uh, whereas their Clos de Bears tend to be higher. They've got more than one parcel of it, plot of it, but they tend to be a little bit higher on the slope. Um, so, but, you know, horses, courses. Right, so you tell me, of the three wines in front of you, um, tell me how they're showing. I love the bears. More, more there. Really and more expressive. Yeah. Like more just coming out at you. Yeah. 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 And now, obviously, the Rue Shot, the, the other two are going to be have su sufficient more weight to them than the Rue Shot is going to have. But I hope that nonetheless, that um, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's still showing a, you know, a real class and elegance. Yes. Mm -hmm. agree with that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Yeah, good, good to know. I'm just having a look at my notes. And uh, all right, oh, from September 2021, the 17th, that would have been um, our, our Bergfest tasting when we're tasting blind. Uh, I definitely got a better result out of the um, uh, out of the Chambertin over the Clos de Bears on that occasion. Um, so what what in fact we found that uh, maybe maybe the bottle was a little bit faulty because it was it was rich with a little bit of caramel to, to the nose, rather heady, high toned, slightly varnished tannins. So maybe that bottle was not uh, pristine. 
um, because the, uh, the the Shambhata was uh, was in much classier form. Um, I mean, they were both very nice, but ni neither truly outstanding. We we weren't in my five star territory. Um, and the Ruchat I've only tasted uh, in barrel. It wasn't part of that Bergfest tasting. Um, but um, I'm just looking at my scores then. I gave it 94 to 97 as the bracket as the barrel tasting. Um, yeah. Um, here's my note from Barrel between the Clodagh Bears and the Chambertin. I actually gave them the same score. I said, Cyril prefers to serve the Clodagh Bears last, but she finds the oak effect a bit stronger and the fruit is darker. Richer, more concentrated purple, density is immediately apparent. More robust personality than Chambertin. Amazing length of dark raspberry fruit. Of black cherries too, just about kept fresh enough by the acidity. It may have a fraction more intensity than the Chambertin this year. So, uh, though I gave them the same score, it looks as though I maybe fractionally preferred it, but only by a, a tiny amount. So, um, are you moving on to the the three rue shots now, or are you? Yeah. Yeah. The Fifteen is spectacular. 1507 and 1999, right. So the 15 will have got the younger vines in, the other two won't. Um, but I think it's also quite fun. I, think, I felt that rather than just going through everything in vintage order, it was more fun to have comparative flights. And to see three, three ages of Rouchard is, uh, is lovely. So, uh, well, you all know, I mean, um, enough about the vintages of 15 i'm expecting to be too young but uh, seven should be perfectly drinking but on the lighter side um, beautiful nose from seven yeah i'm not drinking the seven yet yeah oh that's clean too oh that's right <laughs> the 99 is also very good play three one three so, um, so the sevens held up well, very attractive bouquet. Uh, I imagine it's the least density of the three. Um, yeah. But, uh, but it's pretty aromatic. Aromatic is beautiful. And has the 99, because 99 is now really, I think, just beginning to enter a probably ideal drinking. Um, I've had a couple beginning to go over the top. <laughs> Um, the 99 is a bit, uh, bit, bit You've got the next two, have you? You've got the two close as well. Oh, they're coming now. Right, okay. Okay, so, okay, the 99 Rue shot compared to the other two, oh, as good or right. not, not quite so good? Really good. Wow. The shot, yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the right. 15, still the, the exuberance of the fruit. Yeah. The 07 is like cool enough, leafiness. Nice, yeah. Good. The 99, that's good. The only vintage when tasting in barrel from Russo I didn't especially like, um, and you haven't got any today, is 2009. It was the one where I felt the heat had, had slightly got there. Now, maybe that they've um, moved on on the viticulture. Um, uh, but I, I mean, I think they have coped a little bit better with uh, the last three hot years. There was also a moment when it was fashionable to say that Rousseau wasn't as good as it used to be, but uh, I, I have to admit that from my own experience, I haven't seen that. Um, but it is a style of such elegance, really, um, that potentially hot vintages may not be the friends. They've just built themselves a new cellar, I mean, a cuvery rather, and extended the cellar underneath. It's very nice. They haven't changed anything exactly the same format as before. They just have a little bit more space to work in and one or two little tweaks. Um, so it's easier to get the grapes up into the vats uh, than it was before, but they're not really not trying to change their techniques in, in any way. I think they've got a good recipe and I'm planning to stick with it. Okay, um, I shall need to leave you in a few minutes. So you've got the two Clos Saint-Jacques. I'm sure I don't need to tell you about the Clos Saint-Jacques. Um, they have the southernmost parcel. Like everybody, it goes from the bottom to the top. They've got a little bit more of the bottom ground. Um, 
because it's not a it's not a straightforward square or rectangle it sort of slides away um, but that is neither a plus point nor a minus point I would suggest they resisted all temptation to try and make micro cuvées within close saint jacques and I applaud them for doing that um, uh, because it's 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 the three separate soil types that really make this vineyard happen and which everybody can do and here again as with the um, uh, Rouchot, but earlier, uh, when they bought it, when uh, old man Rousseau bought it, uh, was uh, told by his wife that it was too much and he couldn't have that much. So he sold the, uh, one hectare to his um, hunting and shooting friend, um, who was the uh, ancestor of Fourier. So uh, that's why Fourier had the plot next door. So, and as you know, Clos Saint Jacques, it's uh, it was always regarded as number three, and then fourth equal were Rouchot, Chambertin, or Clos de la Roche. Um, uh, I do say I love that Rouchot, Chambertin, but Clos Saint Jacques from uh, uh, from Rousseau has its very special place. Uh, I do think Fourier is brilliant. Um, I think Bruno Claire can sometimes be as good, but not consistently so. And then I think there's a little bit of a gap further back to the rest of the field, i.e. Esmanar and Shadow. That's right. Yeah. Uh, it, it, so Rousseau is a low stem ratio, but not zero. Yeah, no, more or less no stem. Um, Sura said they do sometimes put just a few in just for really yeah. sort of physically, but I mean, effectively, it's no stem. Yeah. And that, and they, in, in a mix of like 13, they would have included a bit of stems? In 13, no. Oh, okay. No. The, the, the re, you might include stems in the hot years, but not in 13, which was a very, 13 was an October vintage. I mean, that would have been picked um, around 8th, 10th of October, um, which is <laughs> extraordinary when you think of it today. Um, but, uh, but yeah. Um, and um, yeah. we were get, we we're going to have the Chambertin 13 the other night, but we felt after the Latache um, 17 that it, it wouldn't have made sense. We didn't have it. So last time, uh, the 13, have I tasted the 13? I don't think I've tasted the 13 recently, I must admit. Um, um, when I last tasted the 2005, I said, try again in 2025. Uh, so um, <laughs> you're a little bit ahead. Um, gosh, yeah, I'm just checking. I don't think I have tasted the 2013. At least I haven't got a note on it. How, how are they showing? Great, they're absolutely great. Yeah, you know, you know what's striking is the consistency yes, that we've had so far. It's just stunning. nothing you can say is rubbish. Character, yes, as you taste the 99 versus there's no heavy hand in the winemaking, right? But, but the point is, they make everything in exactly the same way every year, which means <clears> the vintage character comes through. And a lot of other people try and compensate for the vintage. Um, so, you know, if it's a year with strong tannins, they extract hardly anything. If it's a year with hardly any tannins, they extract a bit more. And, the, and as a result of which, you get a slightly more standardized result, um, which you know, may or may not be what you want. So Rousseau just say, you know, <laughs> we grow the grapes properly, we make the wine the same way, and then it will be what it will be of that year. And well done yeah. to them for doing so. So is, is, is the 05 accessible or is it still saying how much too young? Uh, it's accessible, but it really needs time. It can take time, but it's it, you can see the magic. Um, we, we've now covered all the different vineyards that you're going to be drinking tonight, and um, in common with with our other occasions, um, I will leave you to enjoy the remaining bottles over dinner and um, relax with them. Um, but is there anything else you'd like to ask either about what we've had or what you're about to have? Um, um, can I ask a question about the ones we're not having? Right, um, yes. I know we've obviously the top stuff here, but equally, I've always liked Clos de Roche, for example. Yep. Uh, maybe the Charm and the Massey, maybe a little bit more consistent in my experience. But just interested to hear your, your views on some of those. And even frankly, the village um, Chevrolet, I've really always enjoyed too. Yeah, no, I think the village Chevrolet, since the time that Eric took over, has become quite a lot better. 
um, and these days I think it's a, a exciting wine and presumably you can pick it up for not too much money. Um, neither of the premier crews get talked about, the other premier crews, Lavo Saint-Jacques and Castier get talked about very much. Uh, Claude La Roche has definitely got a following, um, but it does always amuse me that uh, if you think of sort of two people coming to Burgundy, they knew a bit about wine, um, they'd heard a bit about the hierarchy of the vineyards, and one of them went and tasted at Ponceau, and one of them tasted at Rousseau. The guy who goes to Ponceau is going to say Claude Laroche is a way better vineyard than Chambertin, and obviously the other way around at uh, Rousseau. Um, uh, so it's a pretty good wine. Uh, it doesn't have quite the structure and depth to go on for um, uh, a long time, but uh, but uh, I, I, I put it as number five in the hierarchy behind the Claude Rouchot and sort of the big three. Um, I've hardly ever actually sat and drunk a bottle of Maisie Chambertin, I don't think. Um, <laughs> from Rousseau, from Rousseau. Um, I mean, it's one of their smaller holdings. I've only got half a hectare. Do you, get, do you guys see it very often? Yeah, I don't see it very often. Do you? you don't. No. Yeah. I've had it once or twice. And it's always pleasant, well made, yeah. but not spectacular. It'd be fun to do a Maisie Chambertin evening uh, on one occasion because... Uh, uh, I think um, there are several really quite smart wines in Mazzy and uh, just to see where it stacks up in the hierarchy. Um, but yeah. Just for your uh, top three ranking for Chambertin in general, one, two, three. Who the top three producers? <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's not really much point in going beyond Russo, is there? I don't know, but. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Certainly, certainly top one. Um, Dujac is, I mean, there's so little of it, one hardly ever sees it. Um, uh, so I don't really count it, because in fact, both that and the Romanist Saint Vivant, the uh, American owners uh, said, look, just don't sell it. The very first vintage, I think they offered some uh, to uh, various agents around the world, but they stopped after that. Um, Trappe and Rossignol Trappe, I like a great deal, but um, Probably if I, when either of them is at their very best, Trappe might go a little bit further. You have more experience than with Loire than me, but obviously Loire has got to be considered up there. Um, I don't think, so you've got Rousseau, you've got Loire, and then probably Trappe at third. I'm just running my, um, uh, Denis Morte, it's tiny, but of course it's very good. Had a lovely tasting with them. Uh, uh, Hugo P is so tiny. Um, someone else who's not much um, known about because it's quite recent and he's based in Pomar, but Lorne Orio are making brilliant oh, nice. wines in the last few years. Their 2019s were absolutely breathtaking. 2020, you might have picked a touch too late, but they're breathtaking. Okay. And somebody else to follow, it's not there yet, but there's a change of generation and a partial change of ownership, but Roboso uh, definitely is worth having uh, on, on your radar. Um, oh, nice. Um, so those are those would be the main contenders um, for Jean Pierre, and include them as Pierre de Moir is worth looking at, and he he sells his grapes to a lot of people. Um, Favely is very very good, and with their special cuvee as well. Um, but I don't think there's anyone to touch uh, Rousseau. Oh, oh, Groffier would be up there as well. Um, on the on the at the top of the Clos de Bears. their vineyard is incredibly it's over 100 years old so uh, that helps okay guys um wish you all a very well i don't have to wish you christmas yet because i'll see you again on the 23rd but uh, uh for those who aren't going to be here for that i'll wish you a happy christmas now and have a wonderful rest of your dinner thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.